for my talk this evening, I'm just going to focus really on um, climate and energy policy under Labor governments, because we're in a, cl a climate crisis, and I think that's a pretty relevant uh, facet of, of this discussion. Uh, so I'm going to look a bit at the record of uh, the, the shift towards renew renew that renewables, um, uh, fossil fuel exports under Labor governments, state and federal, um, and then look a little bit at the the nature of how the Labor Party wields or does not wield its its power, um, both when it's in government and also how it uh, uses its party resources. Um, and yeah, I, I guess I'll finish by saying this is why we need forces to the left of the ALP. So um, fossil fuel exports. Uh, for those who don't know, I am uh, I grew up in Newcastle, Mullabimba, and that is the world's uh, largest coal port there. And Australia is one of the um, world's largest exporters of, of coal, um, particularly on, on boats. Russia exports a lot of coal and trains. Uh, but yeah, Australia is um, one of the largest uh, coal exporters in the world. And we are in the middle of a um, climate crisis. So we've known about climate change for many, many decades, right? It's not something that's new. Um, so if the Labor Party really wanted to implement some kind of gradual piecemeal thing to um, move us away from exporting uh, fossil fuels, they could have done that. Instead, what we've seen consistently when um, Labor is in government, both at a um, federal level and at a state level, is they just continue approving open slather, more oil, um, offshore oil fields over, particularly in WA, um, uh, more, more gas fields, more um, fracking. There has been some um, limitations on fracking here in Victoria under the Andrews government, but in general, no real substantial shift away from Australia being uh, also one of the world's largest gas exporters. Um, and I guess there's also a refusal to look at what a what a transition away from fossil fuel exports would look like insofar as if we were going to do that and do it in a way that doesn't leave large numbers of workers uh, unemployed, that would probably require bringing the industry under public control and pumping tens uh, of billions, if not a hundred billion dollars into a transition um, plan, which provides alternative jobs and builds up alternative exports. There's no willingness to discuss so the, even that idea of talking about that is very off limits for uh, Labor governments, state and federal. Um, yeah, so that's that's the stuff that Australia exports to the world. Here in Australia, domestically, we have been moving at a, quite a gradual place, pace, but we have been gradually moving from uh, getting our electricity from burning coal towards more renewables. However, um, the Labor Party, much more than the Liberal Party, have sort of been leaning a bit into that direction. However, they push this in a very neoliberal, privatised market framework. And, and it's uh, in, in New South Wales, it was the Labor government there that kicked off the process of privatising the um, power stations up there. Now, the, the problem here is... The, na the nature of how renewable energy puts electricity into the grid and how coal-fired power stations put energy into the grid is quite different. In, in particularly with solar power, in the middle of the day, there's a heap of solar power going into the grid um, under the market pricing system. This brings the price down. So the privatised coal-fired power stations <laughs> are not making profits during the day. And then at night, if it's windy, they might not make much profit then either. As time goes on, and as we have this market privatised transition towards renewables, we're going to reach a point where the privatised owners of the coal-fired power stations are making so little profit that they can't justify continuing to um, operate those coal-fired power stations. And when that happens, they will just get up and leave. And then it's possible that there will be blackouts. And then it's possible 
that the Murdoch media and the liberals and all the right wing forces will say, see, this is the crazy Labour government, greeny, crazy renewable stuff. And now we've got blackouts. No, no, it's not renewables that is doing that. It's the private owners of coal-fired power stations leaving and creating chaos. So, again, whilst we are moving towards renewables, and that's a positive thing, because it's happening in an entirely privatised manner, it's creating very serious uh, political risks to that transition process. And if we had retained public ownership of the entire energy system, and if we had public ownership of the renewables, we could have a smooth and orderly transition and not risk uh, this chaos. So, um, yeah, I guess by by the Labor Party going down the path of uh, neoliberal economics, they've um, they've put us on a collision course with with uh, some serious problems. Uh, another thing that we see under um, Labor governments is the co-option and demo demobilisation of social movements. Um, there was uh, quite a powerful climate movement during the sort of mid 2000s, uh, during the time of the Howard government. Uh, the Liberal government under Howard were very blatantly not interested in climate action. People didn't like that. They took to the streets. Uh, once the Rudd Gillard government was elected, they sort of said, oh, we're going to have this carbon pollution reduction scheme. And then they couldn't get that through because uh, it was crap and, and the Greens helped to block it, which was supported by the movement. And then later the Gillard government implemented the, the carbon tax and there was this big campaign to say yes to the carbon tax. Um, echoes of, of what's happening at the moment in some ways. Um, and a lot of those activists who had been very involved in the climate movement in the mid-2000s found themselves campaigning for this very weak climate policy that was not going to deliver radical cuts to emissions the ending of, of Australian fossil fuel exports that we really need if Australia is going to play its part in stopping the climate crisis. Um, so that's a pretty clear example of how Labor governments can co-opt and, and demobilise social movements. Um, so in terms of, of sacrificing principles, I think, well, one principle that, that probably the people in this room would agree with is that people and planet should come before profits. Um, Labor governments view it in reverse. They, they are ultimately part of this committee for the common affairs of the, of the bourgeoisie. They're there to kind of manage the capitalist system. They're not there to discipline and uh, completely reshape and indeed pull apart the capitalist system if that's what's needed to protect people and the environment. So uh, we see Labor governments just are not willing to wield the state. So, for example, they're not willing to nationalise or renationalise the energy sector. They're not willing to nationalise the fossil fuel sector as part of a plan to phase it out. It's just not uh, on the menu. Whereas a, um, a party that does put people and profits before corporations then that is a tool that is in the toolkit. We are the government. We are going to take over this whole sector of the economy and phase it out, and we're going to do it in a way that uh, minimises the harms to workers and, and, in fact, ideally does not cause any harm to workers that are currently in those uh, industries. That's just not on the menu for the Labor Party. Um, there's also a refusal to use party resources to build a counterpower to corporations and to the Murdoch media. So uh, back when the uh, Whitlam government was in power, they, they implemented all these progressive reforms. And then ultimately there was a, a, a British and US backed coup against Whitlam. Um, now, instead of um, drawing uh, the moral from that story that, oh, gee, we're gonna have to get a bit more organized if we are to resist coup attempts, mm -hmm. The, le the lesson learned from the Labor Party was, oh, okay, uh, that was a bit naughty. And uh, to avoid that situation happening again, we need to stick within the confines of what the ruling class tells us is acceptable. And we can maybe push it a little bit, but we're not, we're not going to go too far or too radical. Um, 
that's the fundamentally wrong approach, I believe. The, the Labour Party has far more resources and, and far more members at its disposal. It's got its networks into the trade union movement. If the political will was there, the Labour Party could mobilise all of those resources to build a counter power and to build a counter narrative against corporate domination of the economy and society. But they they don't do that. So I guess um, in in summary, the, the Labour Party, and, and Sue did mention this before, um, during periods of crisis or recession or, or depression, Labour governments tend to handle it better. And this is because the, the Labour Party could be viewed as almost like the capitalist duopoly shock absorber. Mm. The, the Liberal Party tries to see how much they can get away with making capitalism even more intense and exploitative and harsh and barbaric. And then if the workers push back, the Labour Party's job is to absorb that. Um, the, the interesting but, but kind of also scary dynamic at the moment is that runaway climate change is very shocking. And I don't think that the Labour Party can just absorb temporary shocks in the way that it traditionally would with social movements. We're, we've got the housing crisis, we've got the climate crisis, the cost of living crisis, we've got weak unions. All of these things are piling up. And I think there's a lot of people are realising that the two-party system is garbage and are looking elsewhere for answers. Uh, so... Uh, yeah, and I, I think powerful uh, social movements and also parties to the left of Labor getting seats in Parliament, and that might be the Greens or Socialists starting to get numbers in Parliament uh, at a state, federal and local level, that those those are, can be mutually reinforcing and start to build a, a counter power that starts to um, create space outside of the ALP so that they're not so uh, able to... Uh, absorb the shock. So, um, yeah, so I think the future is bright and there is potential for rebellion. Um, and I'll finish by encouraging people to come to the People's Blockade of the World's Largest Coal Port happening up in Mullabinba, Newcastle in late November. Uh, we are in a period of wall to wall Labour governments. Uh, generally, at times like this, people can be like, oh, well, we want to let the Labour Party do their thing and see if they fix things. Um, Rising Tide, who are organising this, are very clear-eyed that the Labour Party are trash, that they will continue approving new coal mines when they are in government, and that the only way that we're going to do anything about that is to build a very powerful uh, mass movement, and that's what they're doing their very best to try and uh, cohere and they've been they've done an East Coast tour to try and build this. So, yeah, don't be co-opted and demobilised. Come and rebel at the People's Blockade of the world's biggest coal port.